kick us off? All right, I'll do that. Um, so hi, uh, welcome everybody, glad that you're here. Um, my name is Martin Oliver, uh, he, him. Uh, I am the faculty chair of the AU Core, and I'm really glad to be uh, joined here by some of my colleagues from the Core um, as, as uh, co-presenters for this uh, sort of question about what's in a habit. Um, maybe I'll, I'll let my uh, my colleagues introduce themselves real briefly. Um, uh, Becca, you're first on the, the slide, so we'll go to you. Great. Thanks, Martin. Um, hi, I'm Becca Comfort. I'm assistant director for the AU Core, focusing on complex problems. Um, I use she, her pronouns. And um, yeah, looking forward to talking to you all today. Uh, Brad? Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Brad Knight. I use he, him pronouns. I'm the senior director of the AU Core and of University College. All right, excellent. So we've got a we got a few folk here. Um, I I'm partly sort of can curious. I can I give a quick intro? Oh, oh Adam, <laughs> no, not you, man. No, no. that's fine. <laughs> yes. There's a reason I'm, I'm left off the guest list. That's cool. No, <laughs> I'm sorry. Adam. No personal wound. Uh, hey everybody, I'm Adam Temchaski. Uh, he him pronouns. I'm the faculty director of complex problems in University College, and I'm also with writing studies. Um, where I teach uh, writing um, 100 and 101. Great. Sorry again, Adam. Um, it, so what I what I was going to say uh, is is maybe we get started. We don't want to like take up too much time. Um, but I but I am curious if those of you who have joined us here are are teaching in some part of the core. Um, I, I don't know if we can enable the chat for everybody, but I'd sort of be curious if we like had a list of. Uh, like if you wanted to volunteer what part of the core you teach in um, or what course that, that you teach, um, as maybe part of our conversation can lead us to uh, integrating some of what you do at some point um, uh, in our, uh, in, into the conversation today. So um, Brad, let's go to the next slide and I'll, I'll try to sort of set this up. Um, so why do habits matter? Um, We've got a couple of uh, examples here, and uh, I'll give a. I want to give a little bit of framing to to why we're doing this and um, uh, what we're kind of thinking here. What was the scheme? Uh, some of this grew out of uh, those of us in the core have been thinking a little bit about um, the mechanics of habits, right? Like, how do those work, right? What's the what goes on in the brain? What goes on in our sort of like experience or process of either making a habit or breaking a habit or reforming a habit, right? Um, and 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 then wondering about the, uh, you know, what might it take for us as, as teachers, right, uh, pedagogically to think about habit formation or habit disruption? How much time do we need, right? How much practice is required? Is this one of those things where you need like X amount of hours or particular number of days in order for a thing to happen. Um, we've probably all heard if we made a New Year's resolution, oh, you got to do it for like 21 days before it becomes a regular part of your routine. Right? And it, but it's all a little bit murky, right? Um, and in particular, habits are uh, um, uh, when it comes to an academic habit, it's like, what exactly do we mean by that? So I'm going to back up a little bit. This is where like the sort of seed of the conversation started. And I'm going to talk about the three images I chose. Um, uh, the first, uh, one of my favorite pop philosophers is Mama Bear. Um, and uh, the, the 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 this is one of my kids' favorite books. Now, I generally personally don't always like the Berenstein books. I have Berenstein Bears books. I've got some issues with them. Um, but but my daughter loves this book. Um, what I fear, and if you don't know the story, is uh, Sister Bear comes home uh, having chewed off all of her fingernails, and she's developed a, a finger-biting habit. Uh, and so she works with Mama Bear to break this habit. And Mama talks very sort of nicely about um, there are good habits and there are bad habits and what it takes to to make both of those and how to, to sort of refine those. Um, my fear about this book, however, is that it has taught my youngest daughter to be a nail biter. Um, so <laughs> I think there's, there's something here in about, uh, about how implicit um, suggestion can also be a, a habit creative kind of thing. Um, the other, uh, Stephen Covey's, uh, the very famous seven habits of highly effective people. I put this on here not only because it's famous, but also to sort of like wonder about, um, on the one hand, we could describe habits. I think we could all do this and, and we're gonna do some exercise in this. We could describe or talk about habits, but that's really re very different from, from making one or from having one or for, or for producing one for oneself. 
Uh, and then third, uh, Julie Andrews is here because you talk about habits you have to make a nun joke. Um, uh, I did not take the the habit that that Adam found the image of this and decided to get a little bit more uh, a little bit more sedate. Um, but it, but it gets kind of interesting. I I want to talk about this for just a second. There's a fascinating. Let me see if I can get this in here. Um, if you're so inclined, uh, Miriam Webster has a really interesting etymology of the word habit um, and where it comes from. And that at least in English, it uh, originally meant just clothing, right? One could have a religious habit or a work habit or a, um, you know, horse riding habit, meaning clothing for work or horse riding or for religious, religious purposes. Um, this evolved over time, and, and uh, Merriam-Webster talks about how Shakespeare is probably wrapped up in this in some ways, Of um, uh, and, and Shakespeare uses the word habit just before uh, uh, Paulinus in, in Hamlet uh, talks about uh, the clothes make the man, right, in the sense that um, clothing then gets connected to a sense of uh, illustrating one's uh, self or purpose or being in the world, right? And that this kind of then evolved over time uh, to, to think about conduct or bearing, right? So it's not just like external um, uh, phenomena, but also sort of like internal stuff. And then eventually uh, it turns into this notion of habit as a, as a pattern of behavior, right? Um, it, all of this is also interesting in that the word habit comes at least originally from the, the Latin, um, which, which meant state of being. So there's this really sort of circuitous route by which the term habit comes to us in the English language. And I, I think I would encourage us to think really expansively about habit um, and that these three images here might kind of provide an opportunity for that. Um, the next or last sort of part of the framing that I, that I want to do is that um, our students are all going to show up with all sorts of habits, some of which uh, they developed intentionally and thoughtfully, some of which they know that they have and wish that they didn't, some that they're really committed to, um, but probably mostly a whole bunch of habits that they are uh, unconsciously bearing with them, right? Things that they've done uh, for all sorts of reasons. And I think in the classroom, the question for us is how do we uh, locate, identify uh, and nurture good habits? How do we help break what might be bad habits or, or sort of uh, poorly conceived habits? Um, uh, how do we uh, maybe even make a suggestion that, that the creation of a habit is a positive thing, right? So we've got a lot of questions, at least pedagogically in the, in the classroom. Um, the last thing I'll say is, as context here is that um, the same conversation about habit, I mean, not only does it show up in the core and in, in the label habits of mind, um, but it, there's also this sense that metacognition is a sort of foundational habit that we wish to cultivate uh, within the core. Uh, what's interesting about that as, as a concept or an idea is that it shows up, at least in our learning outcomes in the core, explicitly only in complex problems. But I think is very implicit within all of what we do in the core, right? The hope is that students develop um, certain kinds of metacognitive habits over time that when they then reach, you know, reach graduation are, are really, like really fully equipped to um, uh, navigate our ambiguous and uh, conflicting and sometimes uh, confusing world, right? So, so this conversation, uh, we want to dive into both some of the assumptions that we all make about habits, get into some of the science behind it, and then sort of think about how it plays out pedagogically um, for all of us uh, as instructors. Um, and, uh, and, and in this sense, make explicit that implicit assumption that metacognition is one of the sort of like primary emphases of, of what we hope to attain here in the core. So I will uh, turn it over to my colleagues. Uh, I'm gonna take over for a quick second here. One of the things that we're gonna get to in a, in a few minutes uh, is a lot of the research that we have uncovered about habits, um, a little bit of the science of the neuroscience of it, but also the pedagogical ramifications of habit. And so we thought a, a beneficial thing might be to first concretize this all and, and have us sort of collectively begin naming um, habits. And so there we go. I'm going to drop into 
the chat here um, a link to a jam board and then I will take over screen sharing briefly um, so I, we can see the jam board together. And the first thing is if you could drop into uh, here, if you've never used Jamboard, just simply click on a sticky note on the side and then type up your the thing that you think is important. Um, you know, so for instance, in, in writing studies, um, you know, I might think of extrapolating data out to arguments as an important habit to think about. Um, and so if we could fill up this board with, for you particularly, the, the, the discipline that you're part of, the courses that, that you oversee, um, the positions that you're in, what are some habits that you would say, if you're coming into this, uh, this is something either to hopefully bring with you, but that we'll also work on together. So just take a few minutes and let's fill this up and see what we have going on. And if you have any issues with Jamboard, just let me know. And we'll, we'll leave this window sort of proverbially speaking up for a little bit here. People are really starting to chime in and communicate stuff, but I want to keep gathering. second of early preparation. <laughs> That's why I love Jamboard. This is great. Yeah, there we go. And we can take a moment out to, to take a look at these. If, if by chance someone um, is, you know, let's say driving or can't look at their screen, I'll just give a quick overview of, of the ones that have come up here. Um, habits that, that we're thinking are particularly important to our discipline, our courses, um, the professions that we might be in, you know, for we're, we're sort of academia adjacent and what have you. Um, extrapolating data arguments, being attentive to provided programmatic information. Uh, there's a habit of self-reflection and self-understanding of strengths and weaknesses. Close reading, meaning active engagement with the details of a text. Uh, the habit of attending to and making plain the scholarship of others and our debt to it. Couple people chiming in with early preparation. Um, the necessity of questioning fuzzy language, of getting into a habit, of looking out for language that we need to clear up. Uh, how to prioritize emails and how to read them in a particular way. Uh, the ability to see the situation from other perspectives, uh, always historicize, show your work, your thought process, adopting, perceiving, cultivate, cultivating a variety of worldviews, uh, skimming effectively, and practice, just the habit of practice and all the different things that can mean. So here we've got some, some concrete things that are out there, right, that we've all, we've all said, like, these are important. And I know that if I could help, in this case, students get to these things, I help set them up for success. This next uh, discussion, trying to split up the, the two sides of habits because we, we can think a little more generally, not just about our discipline, but habits that we think are really useful on the one hand, and then above none of that, which is a movie that I think we all need to see immediately. Um, she's the habit that will break you. Is there a better tagline? I'm not sure. But what are some of the habits that we see 
in ourselves, but here we're thinking about our students also. Habits that we see students having that we lament that they have. Um, so let's, you know, as you can, pull your note to the prize side and or the lament side as it comes up. Yeah, and I've been moving them. I'll let you all take care of, of sliding them over to the side that, that you believe it belongs to. So some habits that we prize in our students and some habits that we lament in our students. Hmm. Now, either procrastination is the ultimate habit we lament or we, we need to um, come up with some things. Oh, there we go. Um, lack of attention to detail, procrastination. And we've got a good list of habits we prize. Um, what do we have? I think we've got, yeah, there we go. Uncritical. We can stretch this out a little bit. On There you go. Thank you. Uncritical acceptance of info, sources, perspectives. I feel that. Just leave a few more moments here for people to give it up too soon. Nice. Uh Commitment to position regardless of data. Uh, indeed, dependency on chat GPT. I think avoid responsibility is about to slide over. Indeed, <laughs> there it is. All right, so in the interest of time, you know, we can take a look even, even we have, if things are gonna keep popping in as we, we look, that'd be great. But as we get into the upcoming discussions about the formation of habits and what you know drives them into ruts and how we can change them, I think it's useful to think about these two sides um, because we also have a role in helping ingrain habits, good and bad, right? And so one of the, the questions that I hope we can think about and, and return to in a little bit and talk about is as teachers, what ways might we be playing into students being able to, let's say, give up too soon or um, uncritically accept info? Uh, what what role do we have in changing those habits or enforcing those habits? And that's that's sort of where we'll be able to pick up after we learn about where they come from, um, the science of it, and the pedagogy of it. And I'll stop to turn it back. Right. Um, so I am going to take us through a little high level overview of habits, a little bit of the neuroscience, but really, really basic that Adam was mentioning um, and kind of the structure of habits as according to a couple different authors. Um, so just to start us off, um, habits are something that is ingrained in our neuroscience in um in our neurology in our brains these are not always something that's happening consciously so we do have an area of the brain called the basal ganglia excuse my pronunciation um, that's that stores behavioral habits and this is something that was evolutionarily designed to increase our energy efficiency um especially in the use of the brain so um we are able to enact habits or our brain is able to enact habits kind of subconsciously so that it can focus on other tasks and go through um, life without having to be constantly making decisions, constantly 
um, thinking about what to do next. Uh, our brain has set us up so that we can use less energy and um, be able to think about other things. Um, so it's just like a really high, high level overview of what that is. Um, I'm sure if we have neuroscience colleagues on the call, they could go into much further depth. Um, and we have colleagues on campus as well who can talk more about this. Um, but I think it's important to know that this is not, um, not always something that we're choosing actively. A habit can really be ingrained into our um, like psychological and neurological behaviors. So on the next slide, um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, Charles Duhigg's book called The Power of Habit, um, Why We Do What We Do in Life and Business, uh, which is definitely a broad overview of habits. And he goes into a lot of different um, stories and examples of how different humans have enacted habits um, in some ways that can, he looks into things like addiction and addictive habits, but he also looks into um, other types of behaviors, like just normal behaviors, like walking down the street or turning on a light when you walk into the room and things like that. Um, and what he kind of boils it down to is that there's a habit loop that happens. Um, and this happens both in humans and in, also in other mammals and different um, different creatures in the world. <laughs> um, but thinking about what happens when a habit is enacted, um, essentially you will have, and actually I think we can go to the next slide, but you will have a cue, a routine, and a reward. So um, habits for that basal ganglia to enact the behavior. Um, there has to be a cue that causes that behavior to start. Um, so there's always a cue. Sometimes it is like a time of day. It could be a physical or emotional need. It could be a context or a circumstance or um, something really tiny, like um, feeling an itch on your arm or seeing something, seeing a traffic light turn green, you know, those like little cues that you're constantly absorbing um, can set off different habit, habitual behaviors. Um, the third step in the habit loop is the reward, which is kind of a motivator to perform the routine, uh, which is that intermediary, intermediary step. The reward is what makes your brain or your body or your consciousness want to perform this behavior. Um, sometimes that could be like a rush of um, something that makes you feel happy. It can make you feel stable. It can make you feel like you're in control of a situation. Um, it could also satisfy that physical or emotional need that you're having. Um, or you might not be sure what is making you want to go through this behavior. Um, and then the routine is the actual habit that we're talking about. So um, that idea of close reading or that idea of um, turning on a light when you walk in the room, the, the physical act that you're um, that you are going through when you do this habit. And so I have a couple of examples specifically um, about reading assignments, which interestingly came up in the Jamboard as well. Um, but I just wanted to give some ideas of what it might look like in a classroom situation. So a habit loop might be cued by a student receiving an, a reading assignment. Um, and in this particular situation, the reward that the student might be looking for is increased knowledge and understanding of a topic, um, which maybe is one of the rewards we would hope that students are seeking um, when they're taking a course, when they're expecting to receive reading assignments. And maybe they have a routine where they will be scheduling time to read and using those close reading strategies like we referred to earlier. But there could be other ways that the cue of a reading assignment could affect a student. And on our next slide, I have a different kind of situation where maybe the reward the student is looking for um, when they're going through to do their homework is what they really want is free time. Um, they don't necessarily have in mind or um, know yet what they want to know about the reading and what they're looking for is to just be able to relax. And so that might lead to different types of reading habits, like maybe procrastinating and feeling like they have the free time already. And so they don't need to go through the reading assignment to get there. It might look like skimming the reading and not having that close engagement with it. Um, so 
the I think the point here is that the same cue can create really different um, behaviors or routines that students might be going through when they receive that. Um, so there is another kind of dimension of habit loops that um, James Clear, the author of Atomic Habits, um, talks about, which is a craving step. I think the craving step is really connected to the reward step, um, but he places it in between the cue and the, the response or the routine in the sense that this is how you know that you're being motivated to um, complete this habit. Um, and in particular, this comes with some self-awareness. So I, like I mentioned earlier, you might not know what the reward is that you're looking for um, when this cue happens. You might not even be aware of the cue, um, but these are kind of ways to think about what exactly is happening when I'm going through this habit. And um, I wanted to share in particular two examples that include this craving step and show how some habits might actually end up being at odds with each other. Um, so in this example, I have um, a student who is sitting down at the start of class and they perhaps have a craving to earn full participation points that day. Um, and so they have some habit that makes them think they're going to earn those participation points. Maybe they put their notebook and class materials on their desk and they make a decision. I'm not going to look at my phone today during class. And the reward that they're hoping for is that they will leave class satisfied, no longer stressed out about the participation grade, feeling good. But they might have another habit that interrupts this decision-making that they had already made. Um, so maybe they have a habit around your phone buzzing with a new text message and you want to learn the contents of that text message. And that's how these distractions happen, right? So even if you've made a decision to not look at your phone during class, you might be triggered by this cue of your phone buzzing with a new text message um, and not really be able to stop your brain from going through the habitual behavior of grabbing your phone, reading your text, and then depending on the course, doing that might end up negatively affecting that original reward that you're um, that you were intentionally looking for. Um, so I think it's important to consider that when students are distracted during class, or even um, if students are just doing something different than you expected them to, there might be different cues happening in the classroom that are causing them to think in different ways or to, um, to behave in a way that you weren't expecting. And how can we sit with the idea that there might be competing cues and competing habits within a classroom, both for an individual person and the ways that different students will react to different cues. Um, and so James Clear goes on to talk about uh, ways to create or to break habits. Um, and in his website here, he makes it pretty simple. I know in his book, he will go into much deeper detail about what these mean and what to do with them. Um, but he essentially recommends that you examine every step of that habit loop. So is the cue obvious? Is the craving something you actually want? Is the response something that is easy for you to do? And is the reward satisfying? And then to potentially break those habits, um, some ways to think about that are just to in invert those questions. So um, maybe hiding the cue. So in the example of being distracted by a phone, maybe you silence your cell phone or turn it all the way off. Um, maybe in the craving section, you would want to make it unattractive. Um, I'm not sure, I haven't come up with a way that that would work for text messages, <laughs> um, but that's a way that you could try to invert. Um, but actually, I think, I think the most important part is thinking about what part of each of these steps is, um, is satisfying what I'm trying to do here, what my habit is. Um, to be able to identify the area that can be changed. Um, and actually going back to Duhigg, Charles Duhigg, um, if you want to go to the next slide, Brad, sorry. 
Um, so he spends a little more time talking about the self-awareness that it takes to understand the different steps of the habit loop. So you actually have to spend time and possibly trial and error um, figuring out how to identify what the cues are that are causing you to go through this habit um, to identify what the reward is. And then you can actually, rather than necessarily inverting that craving or that reward, you might also be able to create a new habit, a new routine that leads to the same reward. Um, and that's actually something that he recommends because if you, if your body is expecting that rush of happiness or that um, physical satisfaction, it's hard to convince your body that it doesn't need it, but maybe you can get it in a different way. Um, a classic example is maybe you have a cookie every afternoon and you switch to having an apple every afternoon to have the same sugar rush um, that your body is looking for, but maybe to make a healthier choice. Um, and so in particular, I think this attention to self-awareness and self-examination um, is really important when we're thinking about how to enact habits in the classroom, um, whether that's those individual student habits, faculty habits, um, or the larger academic habits. Um, and that ties directly into this idea of metacognition and being able to be self-aware, understand your own thinking, reflect on that, and then at that point, you can potentially make a change. Um, and then the last thing that Duhigg really um, emphasizes is that when you're trying to change habits or build new habits, um, it is pretty well documented that when you're in a moment of stress, it can cause you to lose trust that the new habit will lead you to that place where you're feeling satisfied with um, what you've done or you have that kind of like physical satisfaction. Um, and so he talks about how there's kind of a need to have faith or belief in the idea that this new habit will work, because otherwise in these really stressful situations, your brain will revert back to whatever habit it knows that it's been doing that's been stored in that gland for so long, uh, or in that area of the brain for so long. Um, and so this, I think, is really important in as we're thinking about college students. Um, college students are going through moments of stress. Maybe it's midterm season and all semester you've been working on um, building some new habit, but the midterms hit and they get stressed out. They might not consciously be able to continue the new habit and they might revert back to something older. So thinking about um, being aware of those stressors and then having faith that a new routine or something new that you've learned will work as well as what your old habit was. Um, so that's my short overview. Brad, do you want to take it? Yeah, thanks, Becca. So this uh, cartoon, although it, it is focused on the end of the semester, felt prescient for this moment with our students about to arrive on campus. Many of them are setting goals for the year. They have grand intentions of starting a new study habit, of being a better note taker this term. And unfortunately, prior habits are, are a stronger predictor of future behavior than, than either their goals or intentions. And so as instructors, as, as staff, as, as colleagues, we wanna think about how we can support environments that do uh, contribute to them overcoming that prior habit and uh, adopting new and more productive ones for the upcoming year. So with that in mind, thinking a little bit more about the, the nudges that we can use, while although we think about this so much as a self-regulated piece, there are ways that, that we can structurally uh, influence the habits that the students are, are um, developing and adopting and, and actually successfully implementing in our courses and in their time at AU. So if you think about the, the three different pieces that uh, Becca was talking about, but I'm sort of gonna reframe them as motivation. Uh, so that goal piece, uh, metacognition, that knowledge of how to go about it, and then the context, so what's that cue? So first taking up this idea of, of using policies to reduce those temptations. So 
you might have sort of structural pieces of your class, like let's all put our phones away. I'm going to silence my phone now, as Becca was describing. Um, maybe there are other technology pieces, like for this activity, we're going to put away our laptops. For this activity, we are going to use our laptops and just very intentionally moving between those. And I, I'm sure you can imagine others that are similar in, in nature. Also, this idea of of stacking. Um, habit stacking is, is a, a way of pairing a new habit with a particular time and location, um, or, or rather than a time and location, you're pairing it with another habit that you've already formed. Uh, so think about it in this way. The formula is that either after or before a current habit, you will now fill in the blank. So uh, for example, after I pour my cup of coffee each morning, I'm going to text my mom. After I take off my work shoes, I'm going to immediately change into workout clothes and thinking about it in that way that you're sort of automatically folding these things and stacking them up together. And so what might be examples in your own classroom, thinking about what habits you've already got uh, as sort of like launch pads for them as a way to think about it. Perhaps there's a prompt that you're putting up on, on your board at the start of class that gets them into the the way of thinking that that will hopefully help successfully move them into the material. Uh, also restructuring your learning environments. That cue is, is really almost the most important part of the uh, habit formation. And, and uh, so you can think about what are ways that you can support that, whether that's forming study groups, whether that's uh, using uh, resources like having a program leader or a core leader or other uh, supports to sort of really structure settings where students can study together. I'm really thinking about how that environment of the class or around the class shapes that behavior. And then also addressing the systems that inhibit habit formation. There are some habits, negative habits, that, that just create a block towards adopting new habits. In the K-12 literature, often this is, uh, the two big ones are sleep and hunger. Uh, we know that uh, having school start uh, early in the morning is not ideal for most uh, students. And, and similarly, that uh, a lot of uh, standardized test uh, performance can be associated quite readily with, were they hungry or not? Were those students actively on, on uh, SNAP benefits. And so really thinking about those pieces. And Becca, I know you were in a session that, that called to mind this piece too. Yeah, um, and so as we think about like classroom and academic habits in particular, I kind of pulled these into a couple categories, although I think they can all be a little bit intertwined as well. We've talked a lot about student habits um, and the things they might be cued by or triggered by, but there are also faculty habits. What are the ways in which you're um, coming to class? Even to Brad's example, like we're all gonna sil silence our cell phones now. Um, does the faculty member do that as well? Or is it just asking, or are they just asking the students to do that? Um, and then also what types of um, reward systems are you putting together for your students? Uh, so if a reward system is all just about getting to that free time or getting to the grade, the check the box kind of thing, um, are you cultivating a space for students to develop a, a desire to learn and grow and to be more deeply engaged with the topic? Or are you just cultivating um, students to say like, yes, I got through the class. Um, so those are things to just be reflecting on. Um, and I also wanted to talk a little bit about um, just earlier today, I happened to be in a session with some of our colleagues, Brian McGowan and Felton Moss, and they brought up um, habits of discussion in a classroom and how they can really make or break the dynamics of a class um, or reinforce toxic behaviors as well. So um, they talked about building a habit to, of how you will respond to a racist or problematic comment that comes up in class um, so that you build that habit and you have maybe the cue is that something challenging like that happens in the classroom and you have um, a set routine ready to go to 
think about what to do. They gave the example of um, learning to call in instead of calling out in that type of situation. Um, but just generally, you might want to examine what your typical habit is in a situation that's challenging in class, and then um, figure out how you might want to make a change um, based on those types of cues. And then um, I also included habits of academic work here. I think calling back to um, the original gym board, what's important in your discipline, what types of um, kind of inquiry and academic habits do we want our students to be learning and taking forward um, maybe throughout the semester or into future classes, whether that's incorporating multiple worldviews or doing that close reading and engaged reading. Um, how do we build those habits for our students across multiple classes? And that sets me up perfectly to introduce and make our pivot more from those uh, uh, sort of academic uh, sort of success habits towards academic habits of, of our disciplines and fields. As we've made this turn towards recognition that it's not all content that we care about, but the ways of thinking and knowing, we've turned towards thinking about how do we prepare our students to think like a historian, a sociologist, et cetera. And thinking then about what that challenge sets up for us as instructors. So I know that one of the, the questions you might have, or I anticipate that one of the questions you might have is like, how long does it take to develop a habit? And unfortunately, there is not a hard and fast answer to this question, as, as I suspect you also anticipated. On average, the literature seems to suggest that it's about 66 days, but the studies range from findings of 18 days to 254 days. Now, put that uh, against your syllabus and that creates a complicated formula because this varies based upon the intensity and the frequency and the difficulty of the habit that you're trying to instill and cultivate in your students. And particularly with our disciplines and fields, it's challenging because this is a threefold task. We want them to know what, we need them to, to have some content knowledge, we need them to know the hows, and we also want them to know that metacognitive piece, the how do I know? And so this is a, a difficult uh, challenge that we're setting up for ourselves, made all the more difficult by this last piece. The cues that uh, most commonly allow us to successfully perform our habits are stable. They look alike to our brains. How successfully do we think our courses are preparing students to move from our course to other experiences, whether that's later courses that they're taking, whether it's drawing upon courses that they've come from, or as we think about how we're setting them up to move out of AU and into their potential careers and later studies. And, and I'm, this is kind of the whole ball game, right? This is, we want a student to uh, take a creative aesthetic inquiry habit of mind course Maybe it's an art history class on the Renaissance. And then we want that student, maybe they're a political science student, to be watching a political ad and be unable to not realize how those habits are informing the way that they're seeing that ad, how lighting is used and the choices that are made in its construction. And if we are not setting up our courses in ways that are uh successfully allowing them to make that leap, it really calls into question how well we've done this. So I really want to set that as my provocation to you all to really focus on in, in the semesters ahead. So just to give you a, a really concrete sense of how we start to think about this, I pulled uh, three of the National Council for History Education's Habits of Historical Thinking and started to then uh, extract what I would think about as strategies that I would want them to be practicing in our class. And so you can start to see how grasping the significance of the past and shaping the present uh, might show up in sourcing, corroborating, contextualizing, close reading, and so on. 
And you can start to imagine then what that might look like for your own field or discipline. But a good place to start, and we always come back to them, your learning outcomes. Uh, these may be ones that you've been given that are associated with your course, either because it's part of the core or uh, serves a particular purpose in your major. Uh, but they often articulate what these habits are that we want students to, to walk away from our courses with. So I took as one example, the creative aesthetic learning outcomes, and I won't read them here, but if you take the, moment, the time later to go back and, and look at these or other learning outcomes, you'll see that they start to develop habits that by the end, if you are thinking about that final project, that big culminating thing that they might be doing at the end where they're seeing it all, there are probably some automatic habits, maybe that first learning outcome of creative aesthetic that perhaps in the instructions you haven't expressed uh, explicitly because by that point you're expecting them to do it automatically. And so I would invite you then to look at your course and think about have you provided them with the opportunities to practice it repeatedly in ways that they can successfully enact that at the end of your course without really explicitly being cued? Has that shortcut been established? And now I want to take, take this moment to take all that we've learned about the cues, the rewards, the routines, um, pointing back to our conversation about the habits we prize and those we lament. I just want to spend a few minutes putting this all into practice and, and sort of collectively workshopping um, some possibilities here for it. So I've dropped into the chat yet another Jamboard. I do love Jamboards. And what I did was pull some of the, because for time we couldn't do them all, I pulled some of the habits that we lament from our previous Jamboard, thinking that what we could do is one by one um, with each of these, brainstorm some of the cues that might trigger this habit for students. So with that first one, when is a student going to feel this dependency on GPT? What what would be the cue to use the language of, of the day that you might think of? So again, if we could just click on a sticky and drop some ideas. Um, yeah, we'll just fill this up and take a moment to look at these. These are the things that are going to get students running toward their keyboards and chat GPT. So far, we've we've got ultra rigid due dates. Um, they feel overwhelmed by having to generate their own ideas. They're concerned about grades. The rubric isn't clear. The unclear direction. So uh, clarity. These two things getting bound by that. Any other cues that that you think? All right, that's why a student goes to GPT. So looking at these, these five, and really we can bind those last two together with this idea of clarity, you know, what we what we hope today offers you is a way to think about uh, unclear purpose, oh, concerns about their work measuring up, um, which might be connected to grades. Whichever one of these, and there might be multiple, but whichever one of these feel really authentic to you and to your class, then we can begin to think, how do I start making that cue invisible or less urgent? Um, you know, those of us at AU who are part of the ungrading uh, movement, for lack of a better phrase, uh, that concern about grades and students worried about their, their purpose, oh, sorry, the, the quality of their work. Well, this is a place where we might be interrupting that cue, right? So if grades have become one of the motivating moments that get into the habit of using chat GPT or other such tools, how can we interrupt that? Changing our grading systems might be one of them. Um, someone noted right off the bat, ultra rigid due dates, right? If this due date is looming, 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 and a student um, begins to feel so desperate that they turn to this drastic step, is there a way, and it doesn't have to be one or the other, either it's ultra rigid or it's ultra lax, how might we present our course, our materials, ourselves in ways that let them know, you can come talk to me, there are other ways to deal with this than ChatGPT, AI, anything else like that. Um, 
And all this goes back to the idea of cues, right? It, we, we would be doing these because we'd be thinking of our students, what pushed them into this habit that I want to break them out of? Um, all right, let's move, let's move to procrastination. When does a student procrastinate? What makes them get into the habit of procrastinating? Great, and I'll, I'll drag these in for you all. Mm, lovely. You know, these, these suggestions are really powerful. I just want to really give a give a shout out to how student-centered these are and thinking about what they're going through. Um, overwhelming student life, the brain needs to rest, multiple ones about anxiety, the anxiety about the assignment, um, the anxiety about difficulties or uncertainty with it, fear of failure is coming down to it, poor planning skills even. Looking at these, right, we begin to think, all right, if these are the cues, you know, if if this anxiety about the assignment is something or to go to the bottom one, um, big assignments that aren't chunked out, the task seems so immense that it's difficult to begin. As the, the teachers in that classroom, how do we try and interrupt that feeling to them so that we make sure we reveal the scaffolding explicitly? We give them timelines of recommended progress and process. Um, how can we help them think about the perspective of the assignment's value. So that it doesn't become that they fear failing it, that instead they see it as a chance to grow, not as one more thing to do that gets in the way of them wanting to do it, which gets in the procrastination. Um, the brain needing rest, overwhelming student life, you know, some things reveal themselves as mostly out of our hands, but maybe we can figure out ways to build into our suggested planning. And I've done this on, on past assignment things where students have asked me like, can you just map out how you think this would work? And I have literally done a day by day. Well, this is what you might do. And every four or five days I would build in, not because I thought that they would literally follow my map, but because I wanted them to think about this for themselves. I would build in a, don't do anything about this project tonight. Watch a half hour of TikTok, go for a walk, play Xbox. Like I would build in, like, it's okay to plan downtime. It's essential to plan in downtime for yourself. Um, and so maybe that's a way that you could become part of their bigger nest of issues is by modeling for them that sometimes your brain needs rest. I don't expect you to go, 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 go. Um, and so lastly, I think we've got some time. I'd love to see this last one. Um, if one of the things that students sometimes present with, and obviously we know that's not only students in our lives, but this uncritical acceptance of information, sources, perspectives, it's interesting to think about. I'd, I'd love to see what, what your responses are. What cues students into that behavior? Why do students begin to want to uncritically accept things? What's the cue? All right, I'm just going to take that in right now. In this moment, I'm not going to question it. When does that happen? When do students fall into this bad habit of just taking what's told to them? Mm. I said it once, I'll say it again. I love being in a room with smart people.
just because I have half an eye on the clock, you know, these are three great ones that, that we can we can just riff on for a hot moment here. Um, the fear of upsetting their comfortable preconceptions and beliefs, right? Which which kind of leads itself to one more punt of, well, why are they afraid of that? And of course, now we're just getting to the human experience. It's hard to be unsettled. It's hard to be uncertain uh, in a world that around us has changed all the time. And most of it's on fire and parts of it are shaking and there's storms here and there. And that's not even the personnel that we see going on in the country around us. It's tough to ask a student to sit with uncertainty, right? There's a there's a piece, I mean, Emerson talks about this in his essay on intellect, which I share with my complex problem students on day one. Um, it's much easier to be at repose than pursue truth, Emerson says. Um, it's tough to be in that, that liminal space between certainties. Um, that lack of confidence, their own intellectual authority, just dropping in lack of awareness, they don't even know that they're out there. Right. So maybe it's not that they're consciously thinking, I'm not going to accept those perspectives. They don't even know what they're missing that's going on out there. Um, and that last one, there are no models for them. They they haven't been taught. Uh, I was just talking to someone about John Warner's book, Why They Can't Write. Um, and part of his argument about students that come up through our US system is that they're not taught to critically engage when you teach to the test. When you make an SAT score, an ACT score, um, an AP score, the be all end all, what you reward is conformity to forms, not independence of mind. So they haven't been given these models. And last, we'll say this, if, if these are the cues, right, we can see how core is working to already interrupt those. Um, one of our learning outcomes for complex problems is diverse perspectives. It's the first among equals, you might argue, because it's literally the first on our chart. We, we need to make them aware. How do I find them? How do I evaluate them? How do I wrestle with them? Um, but also like this blue note, as teachers, how do we give students confidence in their intellectual authority? If we situate ourselves as lecturer, lecturers who give knowledge, right? The banking model that, that Frere talks about. Well, students aren't going to gain that confidence. How do we let them know that their knowledges are prized while also letting them know that their knowledges shouldn't be static? Oh, it's like teaching is difficult. Say that out loud. I'm like, damn, that sounds hard. Sure does. Um, and so, you know, this is the kind of work that you could do for any of those that came up on the old jam board. Anything that you think of um, with your own students, habits we haven't talked about that you see your students doing to reverse engineer backward. What are the cues that might be triggering that for students? In my limited role, how can I help them learn to interrupt those, learn to make them invisible, learn other cues, learn other rewards, other routines? And that was really great. And um, I, I think what I want to do, I'm going to do like a real quick overview of what we did. And then I, I might give some space here for questions or engagement with you all. We also um, have a, a variety of examples. Um, let me get to that. So so right, we, we, we learned a little bit about the sort of like science of, of habits and habit formation and habit disruption. Um, we talked a little bit how to then apply those uh, sort of conceptual tools to the to our teaching and to our syllabi, and then we saw here from Adam a, a really direct and and wonderful engagement with that, right? Sort of like thinking through, breaking down, wondering about the parts. Uh, I think you could probably reverse engineer those Jamboards and put it back into the sort of Q reward uh, cycle that that Becca and and Brad talked about, and sort of like really deconstruct how that all works and 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 make that problem you know talking about procrastination things feeling overwhelming right you take it the old Anne Lamont quote bird by bird right you can take it part by part you can really take it apart and put it back together and, and, and make a thing out of it um we've got some examples here of some assignments um and especially from some of Adam's uh courses um about how he tries to cultivate uh positive habits and practices in his students uh, but maybe we'll pause for a moment and and see if there's questions from anybody in the audience or kind of thoughts or reflections on what we've presented so far. You've, you've had some great engagement on the Jamboard, which is great. But um, if if people had things they observed or thought or or wonder about, um, I would love to hear from you. I'm also a fan of using the chat, so uh, feel free to throw things in there. I think it's a a nice space to engage with, even if it 
activates you know, the squirrel part of our brain. Are there any questions about the you know, science and analysis of, of habits or about um, how we might turn this into, you know, or those of you who are teaching this semester, we're busy revising probably our, our syllabi for the next semester. We might think about how to use this as a tool for kind of interrogating what we put in that syllabus and how we design some of our assignments. There's nothing, nothing right at this moment. Um, maybe we'll turn to these examples and I'll give the floor back to Adam and sort of talk about um, how he thinks about these assignments and, and their sort of relationship to habit as a, as a practice. Yeah, and Brad, if I could ask you to turn through my uh, side of things to stop working on the PowerPoint because that's the world we live in. Uh, it's a habitual problem. Uh, so I, I have some examples to show, not just from me, but um, the first one is... Based on this text out of the book I just mentioned, John Warner's Why They Can't Write, Killing the Five Paragraph Essay and Other Necessities. And this is a, a quote that, set, that he's doing when he talks about one of the exercises that he does. And it's kind of informed the way I've thought about the re redesign of my, my writing class, which I'm doing for this fall. Uh, Warner says, I believe there's a way to help students develop, quote unquote, scholarly ways of thinking without staying tethered to the strict outlines of academic genres by disaggregating some of these those critical thinking skills and allowing students to practice those skills before throwing them into quote unquote academia, we can better prepare them for success in that arena. And I, I really like that this for me distills down uh, an approach to, to my classes, which I'm thinking um, a bit like if any of you are, are into exercise, you know, there's been this trend going around of um, high, what, high intensity impact, no, high intensity interval training, um, where essentially you're going to ask students to do a, several different tasks for a quick little burst, but these tasks are going to also pay off in bigger, quote unquote, more collegiate skills down the pike. I've also been thinking a lot of the original Karate Kid movie, uh, which was formative for me in the 80s. And, and those of you that, that know the movie, what I'm talking about, if not, I'll give you a, a quick overview. But essentially, uh, Daniel is trying to get trained in martial arts. He goes to Mr. Miyagi and Mr. Miyagi has him do things like sand the floor and wax the car and paint the fence. And Daniel gets really frustrated that instead of learning karate, he's been doing all these things for Mr. Miyagi. And then Mr. Miyagi shows him how the movements that he's been doing, paint the fence, wax on, wax off, sand the floor, are actually the fundamental moves of defensive karate. And so I'm thinking in the same way that these habits that we have students do, we can do them in ways that are enjoyable, that are seemingly perhaps disconnected from academia, in ways that are much more connected to their lives, the things that they do every day, to show them that these particular habits of mind, these cognitive habits, can be used in other contexts for us, particularly academia, of course, but even beyond the, the, the four walls here of the ivory tower. So this the set of keys you can see, this is an exercise Warner does called, who are they? And he shows them this picture and all the students get is this set of keys. And he says, who, who owns these keys? What do you know about them? What can you argue about this person based on what you see? You know, and so the students will begin to look at, well, you know, I see that there are two sets of car keys. There are two car fobs on here. So they must be relatively well-to-do if they come from a two-car family. They may well be in some sort of relationship because why would one person have two cars on their own? Um, they can look at the, the, uh, the Illinois model and begin to wonder about, well, what does that say about them? Is that a university? Is that some institution? They see a house key. They see what maybe looks like an office key. Um, and so the students begin to take these disparate bits of data that are on this, this, car, car, this set of car keys and they have to practice coming up with an argument. 
And so here's a way to get students working from data points, making arguments, corroborating themselves based on other data points in ways that happen all the time. Um, and we're gonna have them do this, right? Instead of a set of car keys, maybe your class gives them four academic articles or it gives them three paintings, or it gives them um, five different lab reports, whatever. We want them to be able to synthesize data and come up with arguments on their own from it. And so an exercise like this, I'm gonna use this literal one, but I'm also gonna bring in things like Tinder profiles, uh, Spotify playlists, out pictures of, of outfits, things that, that they do all the time, right? We make these decisions, we make these arguments based on how these separate bits of data work together. Um, and so that's a habit of mine that I think will be fun for them to practice, but this will be one of our things that we do on a, a kind of daily basis. Uh, the next slide, please. Uh, another thing I'm gonna be doing, because if I did this, this Jamboard with you and I talked about in my discipline, um, a habit that I think is important. I think people need, should get into the habit in, in college, in the real world, of wondering about the expertise. What makes a good expert in the moment, right? It's not merely the, the letters after your name. In every, every context, the expertise changes. And so one of the habits that we're going to do is this find an expert. I will bring in a question and it will be something like, um, you know, who would be the best person to tell you about how to field dress a deer? Who would be the best person to tell you how to beat this video game? Who would be the best person to tell you the best restaurant in Washington, D.C., the best class at AU, so on and so forth? Like questions that run the gamut. And I'm going to give them just a few minutes on their own to fill in this chart. Who could be a good expert? What made you think they could be? What's the compelling credential? And then I want them to express, well, what concerns could someone bring up with this, this expert? Maybe... Uh, the, the, the paper they found is too old. Maybe it seems like it's biased, but in a way that feels more authentic than teaching them about say crap testing, which is you know still a very valuable model in, in, in writing studies and, and rhetorical studies, have them do this work that they, they should be doing in the quote unquote real world, right? Thinking about where do I go for this info? Why do I go there? What makes me a little skeptical about this source? And so every day that we do this, you know, we'll have 19 different experts. Well, and they might come across the same, but, you know, we'll have 19 different answers um, with people wrestling over trying to defend why theirs is the best expert, why the other person's. And in doing that, they'll accidentally, the way that Daniel accidentally learned some moves by painting the fence, they'll accidentally learn how to look for sources, how to evaluate sources, how to be skeptical about sources. Uh, another example. Coming up next, uh, these are things I do called ARGs, which I, I have done off and on almost for my entire 19 year career. I went away from them for a while. I've come back to them for the last couple of years because um, they're actually quite useful. Uh, I use this system called Toolman Argumentation. I won't, I would say bore you, but I won't bore you uh, with going much into depth, but it's a way of understanding arguments. Uh, and essentially it comes down to a legalistic understanding of how an argument depends on evidence and the logical bridge from the evidence to the claim. And what I do with this is I ask students just to, to literally map it out, to understand how someone has tried to convince them of something. Um, it could be Taylor Swift lyrics. Someone did a, a, a tank top that merely said free Snooky on it last fall. Apparently, Snooky had been jailed for public intoxication, but we talked about how the tank top was making an argument. The claim being Snooky should be freed. The support not stated, but the implied support is no one should be unjustly, no, because she was unjustly imprisoned, the warrant, the logic being, look, no one should be unjustly imprisoned. Therefore, if Snooky were unjustly imprisoned, she should be freed, right? And so it helps them see that everywhere around them are these arguments. And sometimes the place that you can apply the most skepticism is the evidence. Sometimes it's the logic behind the evidence. The evidence might be quote unquote correct, but the logic that brought the evidence there, that's where the real problem is. And so we're gonna do these in class. Um, last year, I had them do it separately and turn them in. 
I'm going to work much more collaboratively and publicly so that students can learn from one another. So they're doing way more talking in the class than I am. Um, and this is, I hope they get into this habit of thinking, what are you trying to argue? How are you trying to back that up? And what is your logic that brought in that evidence there? Um, and then I believe there's one last example um, from mine. These uh, are quizzes that I've been doing for quite a long time. And, and just to give you a, a quick overview, what I want, the habit I want to inculcate in students is annotating, being critical readers. Knowing what you don't know when you're reading can make the difference between understanding a paragraph and not, which means understanding a text or not. And so the way that I do this, I open up class for the, the first five to six, however long it takes, just five questions. Typically it's five questions and it's open book. And so I've got a pretty good sense of what students know or don't know, like most of us do. And so I'll point them to the page number and say, you know, in, in Coates' memoir, he writes, um, it's like Pont Celestia from the Nine Hells of Bator. My guess is most kids don't know that. So I'll ask them, what is that reference? And what I want is when they were reading in the previous days to have been like, you know what? I know what that is. I've played Dungeons and Dragons my whole life. I don't need to look that up. Or to know, man, I have no idea what that is. Look it up right then. Put it in the margin. Complete the thought so that they learn. Look, if I don't know a word or a reference, let me look it up. Let me put it in the margin. Um, and that's going to help me become a better reader. And so my quizzes are meant to inculcate that. Uh, and I can say this, they do. I have had multiple, multiple students come to me. I, so I work with almost always exclusively first year students. They come back their junior year and, and many of them have been in the same, apparently there's a big IR class. They're taking this big IR class and they come and they say, you know that stupid thing you had us do where you gave us those stupid quizzes and we had to look up words we didn't know and I hated it? Yes. Well, I can't stop doing it because if I don't know it, I think, well, PT would have me look it up. So I guess I'll look it up. So in my IR class, we had this big reading and I stopped and I look up these words I didn't know. And in the middle of class, the professor asked, who knows what this is? And I knew it. And I, the prof was just amazed and thought I was great. And it's all because of your stupid quizzes. Oh, we're out of time. Um, so I'll just say that's evidence that it inculcated the habit that I wanted. Um, the last example there, and these slides will be shared, but it's from, from Nancy Snyder's class. Um, and just very quickly, it, it helps students think about the, the habit of listening in a particular way, connecting the class to this thing that they'll be doing outside of the class. And the listening journal is, is Nancy's really brilliant way into having students do it again and again and again. Thanks so much, Adam. Um, I, I know we're out of time here, and I want to just thank everybody for uh, spending your time with us. Um, we hope that a lot of what uh, you've heard today and what we talked about um, it gives you an opportunity. Maybe we can... Uh, start to develop a habit to sort of think again about what our syllabus looks like, what our, what our assignments look like, maybe how we approach um, different parts of our day-to-day our -day teaching um, uh, to, to affect uh, some of this for all of us. So I, I thank you a lot. But I also encourage, I don't know all of you um, here on the screen, but um, if you're interested in these kinds of conversations, the core would love to have you, right? Um, please come talk to us, reach out to any of us. Our contact information is pretty easy to find. Um, uh, we we want to have more conversations about what uh, teaching excellence looks like, uh, how we can make it happen in the core. And so if uh, any of this really appeals to you, we'd, we'd love to uh, uh, to partner with you and work with you on that. So please drop a note. Um, come on by. I can stick around for a couple of minutes. Um, I think probably my, my colleagues can as well if there are questions. Otherwise, I know that uh, CTRL has the survey there to fill out. Um, and we thank you so much and good luck. Um, let's try to bring some... Uh, joy and goodwill uh, to all of our students and to one another here as, uh, as we enter into the start of the semester. So have a good one.